All right, those, those intros are fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, so good morning, or good afternoon. Uh, happy to be back here at uh, OffensiveCon. So today I'm going to be talking about some um, Windows research uh, I did over the past year that led to finding a local privilege elevation uh, bug. So in particular, I thought it would be interesting to walk through the process that I followed, um, from choosing something to look at, to finding the vulnerability uh, in the end, and then attempting to exploit it. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Um, I currently work at Field Effect, and we're a defensive cybersecurity company uh, providing security solutions to small and medium-sized businesses. I prim primarily work in the uh, Windows kernel uh, as part of our uh, EDR. However, most of my career previous to this uh, has been doing vulnerability research, uh, and I still make time to do uh, some bug hunting because um, it's fun. For this uh, research, I decided to look uh, into Windows privilege elevations, uh, specifically from the various sandboxes. So Windows makes use of several different types of sandboxes, including the render sandbox used by Chrome and Edge, uh, app container isolation, the Defender application guard sandbox, uh, and a few more. Uh, the basic purpose of the sandboxes is to restrict uh, what code running in them can do so that any malicious code is only able to make uh, a limited impact on the system. Uh, and this is done by allowing the sandboxes or code running in the sandboxes to access only a small subset of services uh, on the system and OS features. For example, often that means things like no network access um, and only isolated file system access. So there's multiple things to consider when looking for like uh, privilege elevations here. Uh, the attack service can include whatever user mode services uh, you're allowed to access um, in any kernel or syscall entry points that are exposed. Um, and in the past, I've enjoyed doing uh, research uh, into vulnerabilities and device drivers. Uh, so that's where I decided to start looking for an attack surface. So the, the process of looking for bugs in device drivers has been uh, covered a bunch in previous research and, and other talks. So um, I just want to go over a few of the basics um, just to help make the talk make sense uh, for anyone who's not, uh, not up to speed on it. So traditional device drivers run in uh, Windows kernel mode. Uh, the normal method for drivers to expose functionality to user mode uh, is creating an entry in the device tree. So the driver gets to set access controls and permissions um, on this device entry, and then user mode applications uh, can open the devices as if they were files and send them varying types of syscalls, such as read, write, uh, et cetera. And most drivers use uh, I.O. control messages to exchange information with the, uh, with the application. So when this uh, device I.O. control syscall is made, the kernel's I.O. manager uh, calls the driver to, to handle it. And we'll just go into that call a little bit more. So the, the simplified version of the function call is there in the top right. Um, and you can see, uh, yeah, just the simple arguments, not, not all of them. So the IOCTL code lets the driver know what operation to perform, uh, and the buffers uh, contain data, obviously. And we care specifically about the bottom two bits of the IOCTL code. Um, they tell us, uh, we'll tell the kernel and the driver what type of I.O. to do with the buffers that are being passed in and out. So unlike um, other moderate, modern operating systems, um, where user and kernel memory are separated, uh, and access must be through special functions, Windows takes a bit of a different approach. So kernel code can access user mode memory at pretty much any point, um, but uh, it has to do so inside exception handlers uh, in case the memory gets unmapped. Uh, it's supposed to probe any address to validate that the, the addresses are in user mode uh, and needs to make sure to only capture read values once so that it's not uh, vulnerable to any time of check, time of use bugs. And often drivers will take in complex structures that are coming in from user mode. So that may involve several stages of probing, validating, and capturing the memory. So it's frequently a productive place to look for bugs. Why does it? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's several different types of I.O. for the user mode memory. Um, there's uh, buffered I.O., uh, indirect, outdirect, and neither. So buffered means that the um, oh, there we go. buffered means the kernel will make a full copy of the user mode buffers before calling the driver. Um, so this is the safest because the driver doesn't have to worry about whether the memory is getting unmapped or probing the addresses. It's all uh, in kernel, uh, but it also has the most overhead if you're dealing with large uh, input buffers. 
Uh, indirect and outdirect are similar uh, to each other. Uh, the kernel will probe and lock the user mode buffer, so that means the memory pages can't become unmapped, uh, and the driver doesn't have to worry about uh, using an exception handler. And then the, uh, the OS will create a memory descriptor list, or MDL, uh, which gives the buffer a kernel address. Uh, and so the driver can just access the, uh, the data through the kernel address. Uh, however, the memory is still backed um, by the, uh, the use mode memory, so an application is able to change the contents uh, at any time. And then finally, neither I.O. means that no validation is done at all on the buffer pointers, and they're passed in just straight as they were from, uh, from user mode, uh, and how they're validated and processed is entirely up to the driver. So if we jump back to the sandboxes, um, the first thing I wanted to do was to enumerate what devices you could reach uh, from the various sandboxes. So part of the problem here is that the uh, APIs you'd want to use to enumerate devices are also not available uh, from inside the sandbox. So instead, I just went and generated a big list from outside the sandbox of all devices on the system, and then wrote a little test program to walk through and see if you could open the, each device. So this is the, uh, the, pretty much the code for the, the program. Uh, and so I ran that inside each of the uh, sandboxes to see which ones would return success from creating a file. Uh, and at first, this list was pretty small. Um, I ran it in the Windows Defender Application Guard sandbox and the Renderer sandbox. And, and actually, the Renderer wasn't able to open any devices at all, but uh, it already has open handles to these, uh, these two devices. Um, and I did run on some of the other sandboxes, but with not a big difference in, uh, in lists of devices. So then I did a bit more reading on MSDN uh, about device paths and remembered that you don't have to open uh, only the root device. You can treat them as directories and also open files underneath the uh, device. So when I added code to try that, I was still getting the same list of, uh, of devices, but I started noticing that uh, I was not getting, I was getting back different error codes. So most of the error codes were still access denied, which implied you could not access the devices from the sandbox. Um, but it was getting these error codes up here on some of them. So, uh, you know, invalid device request, object name invalid, and object path invalid. So these errors sounded a bit more promising because um, maybe, you know, sounds like maybe just the path is bad or some of the open parameters need to be adjusted uh, to be able to get access to the devices. So if I considered those as success, then the list had grown quite a bit. Um, no change in the renderer, but a lot more from the Defender sandbox. So I was already familiar with a few of these devices. Um, AFD is the interface for the Windows Socket API, um, and HTTP is the interface for the HTTP driver. Um, and the talk I gave here two years ago covered some research I did into both of those, uh, and some bugs were found. Uh, the CNG and KSEC DD devices, uh, which the renderer also has open, uh, they're related to encryption, and there have been InfoLeak and Privesk bugs uh, there in the past. So the one in this list that caught my eye was MUP, or uh, MUP. And a quick search for this uh, with Windows brings you to the multiple UNC provider. So this is a kernel mode component, which is responsible for channeling all um, remote file system access that uses a UNC path uh, to network redirectors. So there can be multiple network redirectors registered with MUP, which implies that we might be able to talk to multiple drivers from this single device. Uh, and so that kind of sealed the division, uh, sealed the decision that that was where I wanted to spend my time uh, looking for bugs. So before diving into kind of any research project, I like to spend a bit of time to gather as much information as I can about what I'm going to be looking at. Um, usually helps, uh, helps in the uh, bug finding process. So this was through reading documentation and doing a little bit of reverse engineering on how this thing worked. So the multiple UNC provider has been around for a while, um, but it went through a big re-architecture with Windows Vista, like, like a lot of other things. Um, it's supposed to be a single point where network file system redirector drivers can register uh, to simplify other parts of the kernel. So for example, um, there's a file system filter driver that's trying to look at file I.O., it only needs to attach at one point instead of having to attach to all the individual redirector drivers. Um, and when a UNC path is opened, the uh, registered redirectors get a chance to handle the create request. So, and there's, there's an order based on the uh, network provider setting in the registry. 
And once a redirector accepts the create, uh, it's going to get all other file uh, operations for that UNC path prefix. Uh, and it's able to indicate which portion of the path it considers a prefix and which it just considers the normal file path. And actually, there's also the uh, distributed file system client in here. It's, I think, part of the MUP driver, and that gets a chance to, uh, to handle any operations first. And if it says no, then it goes down through the different uh, redirectors. So when a, um, a network redirector registers with the OS, it uses this function here, register UNC provider. Um, and when it does that, it gets a symbolic link created in the uh, MUP device path. So they show up in the uh, Object Explorer. And so you can see this uh, section here from the op device object tree. So I had four, sys four devices on my test system. They're all uh, symbolic links under the MUP uh, device path. Um, and so doing a bit more reading on the redirectors, they all involve the RDBSS, or Redirected Drive Buffering Subsystem Driver. And so this handles the interaction of network redirectors with the I.O. manager, cache manager, memory manager, and some other kernel systems. Uh, by leveraging this, it's allowing the redirectors to have a simpler implementation, because a lot of the common complexity uh, is um, handled by RDBSS. And the RDBSS registration happens through this uh, register mini RDR function, uh, which accepts a dispatch table for the redirector, where the dispatch table is just a, a table of functions, handler functions for the various operations that the redirector might, uh, might perform. And this is all well documented uh, in MSDN, which is helpful for uh, reverse engineering. So with that uh, background, I decided to jump in and start looking for bugs. Um, I definitely didn't have the complete picture about how the whole um, uh, MUP system worked, but I had enough to know um, how the pieces roughly fit together and, and where might be good places to look for bugs. So my first approach was to figure out where the IOCTLs were handled for the different uh, drivers and which drivers might be involved. So fortunately, the, uh, the uh, driver development kit, or DDK, contains definitions for these routines and all the structures involved. Um, so I was able to pull up the definition for this dispatch structure and look down for the IOCTL handler um, entry, which is highlighted here. And then it was fairly easy to search for cross-references to this function uh, and the various drivers and pull up the handler functions of uh, what was going to be handling the IOCTLs. Uh, so this list includes handlers for all the sim links uh, that were there in the previous slide. There's the SMB uh, redirector, mail slot redirector, web dav, the CSC driver, uh, and then one that wasn't in the list earlier for the RDP device redirection driver. Um, and it, that driver wasn't loaded when I, uh, when I ran the list before uh, for symbolic links. So it was important, like if you're doing research like this where you're trying to decide your attack surface based on uh, uh, some dynamic analysis that you consider things like services that might only get started on demand. Like if you start an RDP session, for instance, this driver will get loaded. Um, okay, so we'll go look into one of these. So this is the uh, IOCTL handler for the RDP device redirection driver. Um, and instead of a, uh, you know, a normal IO request packet structure that you would have uh, for the typical device driver, uh, uh, I.O. control handlers. Um, these dispatch functions use this Rx context structure. And like I mentioned, uh, this is all defined in the DDK, so you can easily, easily import the, uh, the structure definitions and source into your favorite decompiler. Um, but it does have the same mess of a union structure that are, uh, that are in the ERP structure. So I usually find it easier just to uh, define my own separate structures for each I.O. type uh, without the union. So uh, the de decompilers often struggle with uh, trying to pick the right fields. Or maybe it's me that's struggling. But anyway, I find this uh, easier. So a couple things to point out in this handler. The first is that the I.O. coming in can either be uh, an I.O. control or FS control, uh, depending on which syscall was used. There's a, the I.O. Uh, NTIO control or NTFS control functions. So both operate almost identically, um, except the major code that comes in is different. So in this case, um, the major code being D means FS control, where uh, E is IO control. And the next thing to look at is the, uh, if you look at the least significant bits of the IO controlled in the case statement, you can figure out what IO type is being used. 
So neither I/O the constant is uh, is three. Uh, so if the bottom two bits are set, then it's using neither I/O. So in which most of these cases are. So most of them are neither. Uh, and then buffered I/O is zero. Uh, so the first and last case here end with eight and C, and the bottom two bits are zero, which means they're method buffered. So when digging into the different functions, you want to remember what type of I/O is being used, so you know. Uh, what checks should be done on the, uh, on the buffers and how the driver should be handling them. So I ended up digging through uh, all of the various handlers for the different redirector drivers, uh, looking for the typical uh, ioctal bugs, uh, things like unchecked pointers, integer overflows, uh, time of check, time of use, race conditions, um, et cetera. Uh, and for the most part, didn't, didn't find anything. Um, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't find anything, so. Uh, so I came to the, the CSC driver, which uh, I didn't know what it was, but uh, again, there's some documentation on it. So this is supposed to handle the client-side caching feature uh, or offline files feature of Windows. So this uh, sounds like if a file is set up for caching offline and the server's not reachable, um, when you try to access the UNC path, it'll go through the redirectors, hit this one, uh, and it can provide access to the file even when you're offline. And so this handler is also processing FS control requests. Uh, and the thing that caught my eye in here was that the input buffer um, is being used without any checks uh, or probing or anything, uh, which would be fine if this was buffered I.O. Uh, and the buffers had already been copied, copied into kernel memory. So that would be safe. Uh, and this IOCTL here is buffered. So that one's good. But uh, this first guy is not. This one's neither, which means that no validation has been done on the pointer um, and definitely looks like a bug. Um, and I'm actually not really sure what this function is doing because it looks like it just sets the input buffer, writes a zero to it, and then sets the output size to zero and then returns. So it probably shouldn't even be in here. Um, but it looks like we can get uh, send in an arbitrary pointer and get a null written to it. Uh, on the underlying part there. So at this point, I uh, was cautiously optimistic, um, but I've convinced myself kind of many times in the past that I found a bug uh, and I get excited, and then I realize later that I've missed some kind of key check uh, and my hopes get crushed. So I try not to get too excited um, until the bug has actually caused a crash. Um, and I thought it was going to be very easy to trigger, just open the device. Um, and if you look at this code, that's like, that's enough to trigger the bug. Uh, it's not very complicated, but this took me a while to figure out. Uh, so the first thing is the create string uh, up there. Uh, you couldn't just open the symbolic link directly to the CSC uh, device. You needed to have these trailing dot dot slashes uh, to get through. And, and I was able to figure this stuff out by doing a lot of single stepping through the various drivers and trying to see where, how far it was getting and where errors were happening. Uh, and the next thing that mattered was the combination of options in the NT create file control, uh, create file call, sorry. Like the, uh, the tree connect flag and the synchronize flag. If you had the wrong combination of flags or the wrong path, then the create would also fail. Um, happily, once I sorted the create out, the uh, FS control call worked as expected and this triggered a blue screen. And so I was happy. So this is the, the crash log here. Um, yeah, if you notice, the call stack here is getting pretty deep. Um, we have things like the, the filter manager in it. It goes through the MUP driver, then into the CSC, into uh, RDBSS, and then back into CSC before finally hitting the, uh, the crash. OK, so uh, at this point, it's confirmed the bug. But the original goal of the research was to use this from a sandbox. So development up to now was not in one, uh, as it's usually a pain to kind of debug um, inside a limited environment. So thankfully, um, Microsoft has a tool, uh, a sandbox tool, where you can run some code in. So I ran the POC uh, inside that, um, and, and nothing happened. So I was trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, I started tracing, comparing successful execution with the failure. Uh, and it turns out that it was failing right away in the NT create file call. And so I narrowed it down to this uh, function at the top here. Um, it was a common create function used in the RDBSS driver. So this was getting called for all the different um, redirectors. And this was checking for restrictions on network open. 
Uh, and if you're running in the sandboxes, most sandboxes do not allow network access. Um, and so this was failing out. And unfortunately, I could not find a way to bypass this check. Um, and so I thought it was a bit mean for that driver to be dangling in the sandbox, letting you think you could open it, and then you get this far and realize that uh, you can't. Well, at least I couldn't figure out a way to do it. Maybe, maybe there's a way around it. Um, yeah, so I did not meet the original goal. Uh, the talk, uh, title of this talk might have been a spoiler for that. Um, but still, going from unsandbox user to kernel is not nothing. So, you know, can, can this arbitrary null write primitive be exploited? Um, so what would I need, uh, need to do that? Um, unfortunately, there's no sort of fancy registry structures that I could use to avoid doing a, a page pool exploit, so I had to go back uh, to that route. But you need some sort of info leak. Um, and fortunately, now, in the last slide, it was unfortunate, but now we're happy that we're not inside the sandbox. Uh, and we're not running the 24H2 beta, so an info leak is pretty easy. Uh, and then we need to find a target structure where overwriting something with null would be, uh, would be useful. Uh, and lastly, we need to do some sort of heap feng shui uh, to get the target structure into a known location so we can, uh, we can overwrite it. So the info leak is easy. Uh, NT query system information gives lots of options. Um, we can leak kernel driver base addresses and memory pool addresses. Um, in this instance, we're going to leak some non-paged pool addresses. So I already have uh, experience of using named pipe structures. And so we're going to target the uh, data queue, pipe data queue entries, uh, as those are in the non-page pool. Uh, and finally, there's a lot of clever techniques to massage the heap into predictable states. Um, but I was kind of aiming for something uh, easy here. It needed to get this done before the conference, so I went with a super simple approach. Um, and I, I talked about a lot about uh, how to exploit name pipes uh, in the talk here two years ago, so I'm going to go a little bit faster through this section, but if you want to know the details, you can go see the write-up from, uh, from that research. So this is the layout um, of some of the key structures for kernel named uh, pipe objects. So on the, on the left, you have the file object, and that points to a CCB, which I think I called uh, the context control block or something. It doesn't have a, I couldn't find a real name for it. Uh, and that contains um, a linked list of attributes, um, and more importantly, pending queues of read and write operations. Uh, the write operations are variable sized uh, and con containing the data in line. And a key feature of these write operations is that you can peek into the write queue and see the data without actually removing it from the queue. So if we fully control uh, any entry in the write queue, then we can get an arbitrary kernel read. Uh, and conversely, if we fully control any entry in the read queue, then we can get an arbitrary kernel write. So the, uh, the info leak. So we can use uh, NTE query system information to leak some addresses in the non-page pool. Uh, and we can also get the size of the pool uh, using get performance info. So like I said earlier, it was aiming for something super simple. So now we have a you know, rough location of where the pool is uh, in the address map, and we know its size. So if we just spray a whole ton uh, of non-page pool applications, uh, making them all the size of a page. We can just uh, use name pipes to approximately double the size of the pool. Uh, and then we're pretty sure uh, if we take the original, uh, the highest leaked address we found and add on the original pool size, we should be pointing somewhere at uh, this sprayed memory. So we'll use this uh, address as the cookie target to try and modify one of the sprayed uh, data pipe entries and get its address uh, in memory. All of these pipe data queue structures have been sprayed into memory. So when the null write occurs, it should land uh, somewhere in the data portion of one of these. Um, since we know they're all going to be page aligned, we can choose an address to make sure that it's not going to land on the header. And then we just peek into each pipe that we created to try and find out where the data has been changed to zeros. Um, and the purpose of locating the pipe uh, in memory is so that we know which pipe handle we're going to get an arbitrary read from. So the next thing is we need to get the flink uh, pointing into user mode memory, but all we have is a null write. We can't just overwrite it with null because we can't map the null page in user mode. Um, however, the flink points back to the pipe CCB, which is also in non-page memory. Uh, so we know that the, what the top 32 bits is, since the non-page pool is always going to be uh, less, or should always be less than four gigs, and the upper address word should be the same as what we leaked earlier. 
So what we do is overwrite at the bottom four bytes of the flink and the top three bytes, leaving just one byte uh, unmodified, um, which essentially is doing this. And so this address, the 88 uh, there at the bottom, is likely going to be unused in our user uh, process. And so we can just virtual alloc that page. And then we have full control of the next entry in the write queue, uh, which gives us an arbitrary read. So gaining an arbitrary write was a little more complicated, but the same idea. So now we use the read to get the address of the CCB. Uh, and then we do the same thing to overwrite all but one byte of the flink pointer. Uh, and we get full control of the read queue uh, entry in user mode. So now we can simulate pending reads in this user mode entry. And when we write data into the queue, it will go to the address of our choosing. So it seems easy enough, but there was a few uh, extra complications. Because unlike the read case, where we can just peek into the queue and we don't change any of the state, here we're going to be completing the fake read requests. Um, so the fake data queue entry is going to be removed from the list. It's going to get freed, and the associated uh, ERP is going to get completed. So it would have to survive all of these function calls at the bottom. Uh, that seemed like too much work to me, so I wanted to find something uh, easier. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was a solution that I liked. So like I said, when kernel accesses user mode memory, it's supposed to do it inside a, uh, an exception handler in case the memory is unmapped. Uh, and this is the right function for the pipes. And when it calls memcopy, it's in an exception handler. And if an exception occurs, it aborts all processing, including cleanup, um, yeah, if an exception occurs. So we want to get our data written, but then fail an exception before the, um, before the cleanup occurs. So what I did was to make a page allocation in user mode, making sure the following page was unmapped, and place the data to write uh, at the very end of the buffer. And then the parameters passing into to write file pass one extra byte into the length. So it would go into mem copy, copy the data I wanted to be written uh, to the destination, and then go to try and copy that last byte, uh, cause a page fault, throw an exception, and then skip all this, uh, this messy cleanup. OK, so let's try a quick demo. Oh, I think I got to ah, exit the slideshow. Oh, really? That just killed my VM. You might have to stick around if you want to see the demo. Is this going to work? All right, I'm just logging into the demo. If I can remember the password. OK. Okay, once VMware decides to, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so the, the demo should go through all those steps. Um, where's my mouse? There we go. Uh, it should run through all those steps to get arbitrary read and write, and then walk back to the, walk through the um, kernel process list, finding a system token, uh, and then creating a shell with that new system token. So we'll see if it does that. So you can see what, Popped a shell, but we'll just go through what it, what it did first before we see if it worked. So it did the, did the info leak, um, sprayed like 32K into the page pool because it's a fresh boot. It didn't need to be that much. Um, yeah, wrote the, the breadcrumb to this address, uh, was able to find the, the target data queue entry, got the kernel read, set up for the write, located the uh, process structures, and then found the system token um, and started an elevated user process. Which system? Yeah. Um, and like I said, I was being lazy, so I didn't want to figure out which process was mine, so I just set everything to system. <laughs> See if. <laughs> Thanks. So, so really quick, I uh, think I'm out of time, but. Um, this is the disclosure timeline. The bug's been around since the start of Vista. I found it back in December. It was uh, confirmed pretty quick by Microsoft uh, and then got patched um, just last month. Uh, so not too bad. A few references if someone's looking at the slides later that I found, uh, found useful. Um, and that's it.
Uh, thanks again for having me. Happy to take questions now. Or uh, these are, if I'm on social media, you can find me there uh, or come find me in the lobby.